Ransomware is arguably today's most prolific cyber threat. This can cause a problem for small and medium-sized enterprises that don't have the internal resources or expertise to know where to start. Fortunately, the Institute for Security and Technology created the Ransomware Task Force to address the emerging national and economic security risk posed by ransomware. One of the many outcomes of this is the Blueprint for Ransomware Defense. It's a clear, actionable framework through which SMEs can defend against ransomware. The heart of the Blueprint consists of a subset of safeguards found in version 8 of the CIS Critical Security Controls. The group of safeguards is referred to as Implementation Group 1 and represents a minimum standard of information security for all enterprises. This is referred to as essential cyber hygiene. The 14 foundational safeguards are the building blocks that are necessary to establish an enterprise's cybersecurity program. They also enable the implementation of actionable safeguards. The 26 actionable safeguards build on the foundational ones and are all about applying the technical controls needed to protect an enterprise's environment and defend against ransomware and other general non-targeted cyber attacks. Focusing on seven major areas, the Blueprint helps defend against over 70% of the attack techniques associated with ransomware. The Blueprint for Ransomware Defense would not be possible without the hard work of several contributing organizations. To download the Blueprint and take the steps needed to defend against ransomware, visit the IST website. All right, well, good good day, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. We really appreciate it uh, for this, the, the final in a series of webinars talking about the Ransomware Task Force uh, and of course the Blueprint for ransom, excuse me, Ransomware Defense. Uh, today in particular, we're going to be focused on cyber resilience and insurance innovation. If you've participated in any of the previous uh, webinars that we've run, those have done deep dives into other areas uh, as well, but today we really want to focus on the insurance side of this, the relevance of the blueprint uh, to the insurance industry and, and, uh, and so on. Uh, I'm very happy to be joined today by some amazing panelists, a very diverse group with a lot of background in this. Uh, Monica Shokrai, the head of business risk and insurance for Google Cloud at Google. Uh, Davis Hake, founder of Resilience. Uh, Prashant Pai, SVP and GM of strategic initiatives at Security Scorecard. And of course, I'm John Banghart, Senior Director for Cybersecurity Services at Venable. So as I mentioned, we're gonna be focused on cyber resilience and insurance innovation. So that will be our topic that we're gonna focus on. Again, previous webinars, looking at other areas, that information is out there. If after today, you'd like to go back and have a look at some of that deeper dive information, uh, that can be available for you. Um, again, as mentioned in the video, the, the blueprint was created by a number of organizations really targeting at small and medium sized business implementation and really focused on trying to make it approachable, make it implementable by organizations that may not have a lot of resources. Um, having worked on the blueprint myself, uh, it was really one of the more actionable tools that I think we've been able to create uh, over the last several years amongst a lot of great work that's been going on out there. So very, very powerful document. Uh, and it was a great honor for me to work on it along with uh, so many other great folks. Um, again, as mentioned, it's comprised of a lot of different controls from the CIS, Center for Internet Security, very, very much focused on the SMB, the small and medium sized business. Key areas, as you can see here, about knowing your environment, how do we secure things uh, or how do we configure things in a secure way, account and access management, vulnerability management, which is one of the key foundations, and then malware defense, security awareness and skill training, data recovery and incident response. If you work in cybersecurity or even if you just work in IT, you know that those are seven areas that are foundational to any good program. And the Blueprint really tries to focus on those uh, in a way that can help you combat uh, ransomware, but also have resilience in your program. Um, so I've already introduced my panelists to myself, so we'll continue on. Again, in this, in this session, you're going to learn about the current state of the cyber insurance market as it relates to ransomware, in particular, sort of what's covered and what isn't, uh, what parts of the blueprint are relevant to the underwriting process. Uh, if you've got questions about what's the difference between cyber resilience versus defense, we're going to try and touch on some of that. 
And then, of course, importantly, what are some of the new innovations, the new approaches that the insurance market is using uh, to help make customers safer uh, sort of across the board? We've got some resources here that you can go and find, including the, uh, the original ransomware task force report, which called out for the creation of the blueprint. And of course, the blueprint itself, which again, I highly recommend that you go and look at. So with that, I think we will go forth and uh, get our panel started. So again, thanks everyone to joining, for joining us today. Davis, let me start with you. Um, talk to us a little bit about how does the market sort of underwrite this uh, today? Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, and I want to thank you uh, and, and Venable and IST for hosting and, and Prashant and Monica for, for joining. I've had the pleasure of, of working with, with all three of you guys here. Um, and you all sort of fit into to different pieces of, uh, uh, of this puzzle. So it's awesome that we're all together on, on one webinar. Uh, I'm interested in hearing more what you guys have to say than me talking. Um, but to kind of like set the stage, I guess, a little bit for where the insurance market uh, has been um, and, and where it's at today and where we really see the opportunity for the blueprint to help um, drive innovation that, that we see is, is, is just around the corner on the market. You know, I'd say that traditionally um, the insurance market has largely focused on the issues of data breach liability. This is where the product was born. Um, this is where it's lived uh, over, you know, almost two decades. Um, when the market came into the ransomware epidemic that started in 2019, it drove some dramatic changes. Um, the changes that customers have seen uh, uh, externally have been pricing, um, more difficulty in gaining coverage, what the market calls a, a hard market um, for, for insurance policies. And a lot of this is, is based on the way policies are, have been underwritten because of data breach. Traditionally, carriers would, would look at paper applications they would have a number of questions around security controls, what, what are investments going on, but really where they would focus, they focus on two things. They'd focus on which industry uh, were you in, uh, and they would focus on number of records that you held, and, and then some controls around how you're protecting those records. But largely industry and record count, because data breach is the main concern, uh, were the things driving this underwriting. When we saw the ransomware epidemic um, start to, to take hold in, in 2016, and then really explode in 2019 and over the course of the pandemic, this just dramatically changed claims for and carriers. And what we were looking at instead of, of fines and lawsuits that it would take you know, years maybe to work through the courts and, and, and pay out the claim, we were looking at ransomware costs where there was an immediate extortion hit from a Bitcoin payment that could be sometimes in the millions of dollars. And then also uh, business interruption costs from that downtime. The ransomware task force has some stats from some of its members that, that show the average downtime for a company from a ransomware attack is 21 days. If you imagine three weeks being down at, at entities like manufacturers or healthcare providers or a big target for some of these criminals, those costs are astronomical. And so because carriers have been faced much more with these immediate costs, we the market has had to rapidly retool to focus not just on data breach liability, which is still a concern, by the way, because these actors hold this data, but more on cyber resiliency of an organization. How prepared is this company where, you know, if the actors are able to uh, circumvent their best practices on vulnerability management, circumvent their best practices on um, uh, identity access, circumvent their best practices on backup and still get to them, which a lot of these actors are doing today. Um, how do we ensure that, that company has done everything they can so that they're not down for three weeks or, or more, right? But they're restoring backup quickly. And that's this idea of, of underwriting against uh, cyber resilience. And so a lot of this is looking at how do you uh, look at technical controls? Um, how do you look at what the company has done from business practices to align their investments to their core business? And when the ransomware task force came in and was looking to make a dent in the ransomware problem, one of the areas we looked at was how do we help the insurance market retool their focus from just data breach liability concerns to really tackle the additional concerns that come with an extortion event. And so as we started working, um, we looked at the blueprint as a tool that wouldn't only help uh, the insureds, but would also help uh, other insurance carriers. You know, insurance is a team sport, right? Like, we write excess on top of our competitors all the time. So how they underwrite accounts and how they work to provide and, and protect their insureds directly affects the rest of the market. 
That's great, Davis. Um, Prashant, or uh, do you have any thoughts on this too from Security Scorecard's perspective, in particular the way that you know Davis has sort of laid out the, the insurance market? Um, what are you seeing from where you said and, and where Security Scorecard plays into this? Yeah, so great, great points, uh, Davis. So if I take a step back, like what does insurance cover? So let me let me make an analogy on home insurance, which is what a lot of us can easily relate to. So on home insurance, I'm protecting my asset, which is my home. I'm protecting against a bunch of perils, which could be earthquakes, hurricanes, so on and so forth. But I'm also protecting my dependency on my home where I live. Because if my home is not available, I have to go live somewhere else. And that's that's an inconvenience. So home insurance policy not only covers if, if something untoward happens to your home, and that is a covered event, then it covers you for rest, uh, restoring your home. But it also covers you for the challenges that you face. Uh, you may need to go live at a hotel somewhere. You may need additional accommodation. Uh, it covers you for that as well. A as you very nicely explained from data breach to ransomware, the big asset that the insurance industry contemplated to cover was really data because data is an asset that companies hold on behalf of others. They could hold their employees' data. They could hold their customers' data. This is an asset that they're holding on behalf of others. So the first is you have to cover for uh, damage to the asset itself. You have to restore that. You then have a liability uh, because you're holding somebody else's data. And the third is as that data is not available, you have your covered for that. So that's what the insurance, the cyber insurance industry was very focused on and had a lot of its uh, machinations in place in order to um, protect against that. As 2016, 2017 rolled around, ransomware started being thought about more as a catastrophic scenario where you could have the NotPetya, WannaCry's, and they kind of raised that as a, a possibility. However, the last couple of years, really ransomware has been what's like a whole set of attritional events, all these many uh, ransomware events. But most importantly, ransomware impacts uh, devices, networks, uh, and the availability. And you can just imagine the uh, reliance that we have. So it not only covers the restoration of those devices, which I mean, you can just go get new laptops but it covers the fact that you now have no longer have access to that. So it's a fundamental change in the terms of how the insurance industry understands what's being covered um, and what, what reliance is not available anymore. So we've, we've you know, had the insurance industry really step up and start to think about how do we assess the risk on this new type of quote unquote peril and the damage that it can create. So that's sort of like one perspective. I would say four or five years ago, if you spoke to a lot of CISOs or uh, risk managers at organizations, the commentary was more like, uh, I have insurance companies, they really don't know what they're talking about. That has really changed. I mean, now the feedback that I hear, or I mostly hear, is that they're asking us too many questions. So that that that's sort of a, a bit of an evolution. And this is where the work that the group has done in terms of creating a blueprint is is really amazing because it outlines very clear a, a you know clear set of criteria on which you can understand what really drives the risk and these are aspects that you know in in partnership we have discovered are truly are truly driving of the risk so you know so two things one is just to summarize all of that one is we are really we have evolved in what we are thinking of is being covered. So the assets, the perils, and the coverage, they're all, all really new. And, and here is where the blueprint is important and our understanding of it will continue to grow. Because at the end of the day, what we want to get to is sort of that building code of um, insurance, right? What, what are the minimum set of controls, capabilities, defenses that we need to have in place so that you can withstand an event of a certain intensity. I, I think that's where we are getting to. And I think you know th this pushes us much further, much stronger ahead. 
Great, thank you. Appreciate that. And and Monica, you know, when we think about resilience, clearly we think about cloud providers, but maybe not so much when we talk about insurance. So help us understand sort of what's your perspective on this, Google's perspective, and bring that into the mix for us. Yeah, absolutely. So at Google, I have two different roles um, that will uh, be applicable here. So I'll talk a little bit about both. First, I'm I help procure cyber insurance for Google Google Cloud, especially, but Google as a whole. Um, and so I can talk a little bit to the risk manager's perspective of this process of how how insurers underwrite and how it's seen on our side. I'd say historically, and this is changing rapidly, and, and this conversation is very much um, applicable to that change. But historically, risk managers had more of the perception that you're getting you're working with a broker, typically, um, who's helping you through this process. Uh, there's strong collaboration between the insurance purchaser, myself in this example, and then the CISO. I think when you think about cyber as a line of business, there's probably more collaboration uh, throughout a company than any other line of business. So they're both groups are working together on it. And historically, um, it's seen as a very tedious process. So you're getting like a 30 page PDF with high level questions. A lot of times I hear from other CISOs um, that they don't know whether to answer yes or no to do you have MFA because it's a multi-layered question, right? It's not just a yes or no question. Um, and it's it's been a difficult process and, and somewhat, um, there's been a lot of uncertainty in those filling out those applications. What we're seeing in the market, and uh, Davis and Prashant have alluded to this, is a change in that over time to get us to a place where we're working towards more automated scanning where, where appropriate, and we can get into this over the course of the, the conversation, um, and data that is from outside in scanning or that's more verifiable. And so we're moving forward in that. Um, but typically, historically, at least, it's been um, a very manual process. John, if uh, I could, I could add to that. One of the things I wanted to share was um, at Security Scorecard, we start from, you know, our mission is to make the world a safer place. So the way we think about it is three pressure points. So the first is we look at social pressure which is where we, we share with every organization that there is information about them, cyber risk information about them, cyber ratings that we have on our platform. They're more than welcome to come um, look at their own information for free. We don't, we don't charge for that. That attracts a lot of organizations into our platform. But then any vendor risk manager, any other third party that wants to work with that organization then we'll come in and take a look. So, so it's important to have that bi-directional information symmetry so that the, um, uh, the reviewer and the reviewee has have you know, the symmetry of information there. So that's, that's the first, we apply social pressure. The second is with organizations such as this, which are public-private partnerships or even working with the government itself, uh, the New York Department of Financial Services, National Association of Counties, we help apply regulatory pressure. And then the third is where the insurance industry is really a re strong partner for us in helping drive economic incentives to, uh, you know, at the end of the day, help organizations, encourage organizations up their cybersecurity game. So, you know, in, in doing all of this, the, the key is we refine the way all of these organizations who are stakeholders in a, a third party organization cybersecurity, how can they look at that in a consistent manner and then encourage overall, the more we all become cyber safe, the more the environment. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And so I think, you know, what I've heard so far from all the comments is there's sort of two themes here that I think are emerging. Number one is of course, how do we improve the resilience of, of organizations sort of across the board? Um, but also then how do we assess the state of that resilience as well? So Davis, let me come back to you. And, and you touched on this in some of your initial remarks, but maybe elaborate a little bit. Um, from your perspective, how does the blueprint sort of help from that assessment perspective? I think how it helps with the building resilience is maybe a little bit more obvious, but help from the assessment perspective. How's that tool useful? Oh, you're right. I think you're on mute. Oh, thanks very much. Um, I think it's from 
the same perspective as uh, how the blueprint was designed to help with individual insurance. So when we were looking at building the this blueprint, uh, one of the things that we saw out there on the market was while there were a lot of top 10 lists for, you know, do these things to stop ransomware attacks, what there was not was the set of building code standards for how you construct um, your own networks, uh, how you implement security controls across your organization in a prioritized manner uh, to defend against ransomware. And since one of the things that we saw in the task force was that 70 percent of attacks were going towards um, small or medium sized enterprises, we saw that, that these were organizations that had limited budget and more importantly, had limited time from from their staff and team to be able to put up defenses. And it's probably also why they're the most targeted. Right. So we we're saying, how do we start to shift some of the economics of this problem? We saw what would be useful is not just to come up with another top 10 list for controls against ransomware, but to use uh, an existing framework like CIS, which is the equivalent of, of digital building codes. Right. And then go through there and say, where would we place our first dollar if we had a really tight budget on defending against ransomware? And this is where, you know, groups like Security Scorecard, like Act Zero, and like our, our claims and incident response teams weighed in to say, what is the, the most effective uh, first dollar that goes into ransomware defense? And so as an underwriter, uh, and I've had the pleasure of, of working with many underwriters as a service writer to them, and now uh, having them on our staff, you know, a lot of these uh, folks are coming from non-technical backgrounds. They're learning uh, how to do technical analysis, uh, how to use data from folks like the security scorecard or, or external scanning or how to match up internal control statements. Um, and they, you know, are, are basically inundated with all this data. And some of it's useful, some of it's not. Uh, but having that prioritized list of saying, OK, here is where a group of independent experts have said, this is the place where you should put your first dollars. And this is the, the place where if you've done this already, you need to make sure that this is also implemented in this manner, right? Mm -hmm. That is so powerful to, um, to have that prioritization. And, and I think the blueprint is really the first effort to do this that, that I've seen, um, not just for ransomware, but, but really in cybersecurity. Um, so I think in terms of assessment, right, we're trying to lay out the, the roadmap for how you should begin looking at, looking at insurance. Makes sense. Monica, maybe I can turn to you and, and build on that a little bit from the cloud perspective, right? So we're obviously, uh, and I think appropriately, you know, looking at more and more small and medium sized businesses moving to the cloud for a lot of great reasons. So where does this sort of measurement piece uh, and using the blueprint from that perspective, where does that interface with what you do and, and where sort of Google views this? Yeah, absolutely. So um, to, to answer that question, I'll give you a little bit of context of the other side of my role. So um, Google launched a program in March 2021. So it's been about a year and a half um, where we use CIS benchmarks and we scan Google Cloud's uh, or a customer's cloud environment for those benchmarks. Um, and allow customers for free to use that scan to manage their risk. It's not exactly IG1, but there are a lot of overlaps with it. Um, and customers will, will use us to, to manage their risk and understand their security posture. Then through a couple of clicks, they can share that data directly with insurance providers and use that to help procure insurance. And through that process and working with customers over the past year and a half, I'll often hear from CISOs or their security teams of, of our customers that they don't know where to start, um, specifically SMBs in particular. They don't know where to start, what to remediate first. Um, if they have a list of 50 things to do with, and they have five hours, where are they going to spend that th those five hours? So um, the blueprint allows us to really focus on, as, as Davis said, what matters most and how to appropriately allocate time which has been really positive. Um, we're, we're working with it within Google as well to understand if we can um, better map our products to the, to the implementation group and then help our customers through that process. So Monica, maybe I'll stay with you for just one second if I could. Um, and if this question is that sort of outside your area, uh, please feel free to pass. But I know that uh, having worked for a cloud provider myself in the past, I know that you're subject to a lot of regulation, a lot of scrutiny. So, you know, can, is, is the difference with the blueprint really around that prioritization um, or does it bring more to the table than say any of the other sort of standards and, and ways of measuring that are out there? Uh, is that a distinction that you can make? 
at w whether it brings more to the table than other other yeah, right. so, uh, the my my question is so when i worked for microsoft azure you know we had a hundred plus sort of certifications that we had to get standards that we were subject to i think some people i've heard talk about oh the blueprint is just yet another standard right it's just yet something else that's not what i think <laughs> i worked on it i think it's awesome but you know from a cloud provider who's already doing a lot of this work it sounds like the blueprint isn't necessarily an added burden. It's actually something that you think is going to help you and your customers. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I think that's a fair statement. I'll, I'll speak more from my perspective rather than Google Cloud as a whole and, and where, where the company stands. But from my perspective, um, the implementation group, I, IG1, is a good way for SMBs to understand where to start. So yes, there's, there's a bunch of frameworks across the board, as you've mentioned, uh, that customers can use. But this, the goal of this, at least from my perspective, and Davis and Prashant can chime in here, but the goal of this was to really tell a, a, a smaller company what matters most, what's essential, and what are you going to focus on first? So I, I still see a lot of value in it. Um, I'm part of the ISD ransomware task force as well, and I've been working with this group for quite some time. So I do see um, the value in prioritizing that for for. Um, SMBs, especially those that don't have a background in cybersecurity and might not have their own CISO. Great, thank you. Yeah, John, and I'll just say part of our thinking as we were, were starting this effort uh, was saying, how do we not just, you know, redo another framework or, or like you said, add another thing that other people have to, to configure to or add an extra burden to? So that's why we went with um, a commonly known and implemented standard, uh, you know, not standard, but um, well-known framework like CIS's implementation group one, right? This was focused down into things that um, everyone should be able to do and that are relatively low cost. And not only that, but a lot of the cloud providers um, are already starting to, to look at how do they communicate back to their um, users in sort of this language uh, of different security controls. So we knew that by going with a partner like CIS, we would already have a step up on um, implementation because then as the individual users could look at this framework and decide what controls they wanted to implement, where they want to invest their money, the vendors, the service providers and security providers would already be in place to be able to help them implement those controls. They're not coming up with a, a whole new requirement or a whole new um, security practice that, that they have to do just to hit that that first level of, of implementation. And, and same thing for underwriters. We've seen a lot of insurance companies look at entities like CIS and, you know, use tools like you helped build, John, like the, the NIST cybersecurity framework um, as sort of frameworks to build our own underwriting processes around. Um, so we see this, you know, as a helpful tool to help translate um, actual defense against ransomware into something that, that is easily implementable and easy to budget against. That's great. Prashant, anything you'd like to add to this? Yeah, great, great points made. The one kind of perspective I would come from is sort of contrasting between hygiene and risk, right? So if you look at, uh, you know, frameworks that were, um, have been, have been in place, they're focused quite a bit on hygiene, which is, hey, here's a checklist of all the things to be done. Risk looks at it differently, right? I am looking for an end outcome of a loss or a claim. And I think the amazing part that, you know, this group has brought to the table uh, at Security Scorecard, you know, about 50%, if you look at it from a premium basis, the carriers, the brokers that use Security Scorecard, we touch more than 50% of all cyber insurance premium that is underwritten and, and managed. So that, that's a huge broad swath of the market. We have innovators like Resilience who combine both the security uh, and the insurance aspects. Uh, folks like Google who have just such a wide um, lens on what they can see. Bringing this amazing capability together, we have really looked at what drives cyber risk, right? Not necessarily just hygiene, but what drives cyber risk. So and and made it super concise, so that it we make it easy for small businesses to focus on what drives the risk and what controls they can put in place, what mechanisms they can put in place to protect against that, uh, as opposed to purely a, a long hygiene checklist, which you could do everything on there, you could do everything on there, but still you know, end up with an incident. I'll yeah, just... for sure. 
Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Monica, please. I'll just plus one that comment that the, the differentiation between hygiene and risk. I think it's a I think that's where the insurance industry can really help the security industry is shifting their focus. Um, you have a lot of experts in cybersecurity. And, and as you're as I'm working more with this group of individuals, I'm seeing that they're they're transitioning into a risk view. And it's not a natural transition. A lot of engineers are thinking about problems at a very detailed level, and that's where they start, right? Um, and so bringing the insurance industry in and bringing that, um, that lens in how we see the world has really helped uh, progress the industry forward. Yeah, and Monica and Prashant just hit on a, a total uh, like pillow spot for me. <laughs> when I started working on a cyber insurance startup, um, I had I came from a security background and I had a lot of friends who were either CISOs or technical security managers say, what are you doing getting wrapped up in insurance? Like, you know, that they uh, underwriters don't know what they're underwriting against. They're accepting all these risks. The, the policies don't pay out, yada, 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 yada. But the, the reason I tell them back is specifically what Monica said um, and, and the point that Prashant was making is that insurance is the has this tremendous opportunity to help take the, the actual risk that companies face, something that we've been struggling for years to try and get companies to shift away from only a technical cyber hygiene um, threat intelligence based approach, which is all an important piece, but to also encompass that and translate that into the company's business and financial risk. I mean, at the end of the day, why are you securing these systems, right? You're securing these systems to help drive your company's mission and serve value to your customers. And insurance is such a great bridge to have that conversation because insurance looks at what's the financial potential for loss from these projects. Um, and even if you look at the blueprint, right, in, in IG1, there's nothing about cyber insurance in the CIS control benchmarks and frameworks. And one of the conversations we we're having as we we're doing all this, this work was that it's critical to engage the insurance industry on things like the blueprint, where we can share what we're seeing uh, helps keep claim costs low, you know, because there are certain controls that we've seen, you know, even if an attacker gets in, this is going to help box in that business interruption cost for the business and for the carrier. And then alternatively, to help educate the insurance industry about the technical controls that might even stop the attack from happening on the first place that, that we should be driving within our own clients. Yeah, Davis, that's a great point. And, you know, interestingly, um, you know, I had a similar experience as a non-lawyer who went to work for a law firm. People would ask me, why are you going to work for a law firm? And similar sort of response, right? The law, lawyers help you manage risk. They help you avoid harm. That's where a lot of that activity happens. And I think what we've learned over the last several years is it really does sort of take that village approach. It's the lawyers and the technologists and the cyber people and the privacy people and um, the insurance and sort of all of that is sort of necessary. And it's, it's really interesting to see that evolve and I certainly never questioned why you were getting wrapped up in insurance. Uh, it makes sense to me. And I think we see today uh, exactly why um, this has become so important. So interestingly, th I think this is a good segue to kind of let, let change gears a little bit and start thinking about moving forward. And we've touched on these some of these pieces a little bit, but let's bring some focus to it. So uh, as we think about where the insurance uh, market goes next, um, what does that look like? You know, let's define a little bit better. What is a more proactive insurance market? And, and we've touched a little bit on some of the things that matter there, like technical visibility. We've mentioned cyber hygiene a little bit. We've talked a little bit about quantification of risk. Um, but let's try and paint a picture for our, our audience today about what should they expect in terms of where the insurance industry is going to go. And Davis, I'll stay with you on this. Um, but then I very much would like to hear from uh, Monica and Prashant as well. Yeah, thanks, Sean. I want to hear from Monica and Prashant as well, because, you know, there's some of the vendors that are helping drive the industry towards a more data driven approach. Um, but frankly, I think the expectations that I talked about from, you know, uh, my security friends that were, were, were saying, why are you going to insurance? The, the risk transfer piece of this can't just do it alone. Um, and, and that's why one of the things at Resilience, we really wanted to start with this concept of how do we build a business model where for the first time we're more of a security company that actually shares the risk and liability for our clients and our goals are aligned, right? So that as we make them safer, we benefit and then they benefit as well too. So we looked at this idea of going beyond just risk transfer to cyber resilience, which you know we uh, think includes the technical visibility, 
that um, you know groups like Security Scorecard do that provide scanning that understand what you look like at, to an attacker. Um, also provide cyber hygiene. A lot of the the policy work, John, that, that you've done with companies directly, helping build you know change within their leadership teams to prioritize investment in hygiene. But then also has that risk transfer that actually rewards when companies do those things well, right? And so I really think that that what we're going to see in the market in the future of the cyber insurance market is that a lot more providers are going to put together either they're going to build it like we have, or they're going to work with with vendors like like Monica Prashant to to build this idea of a cyber resilience offering, and that's where companies are are not just putting up defenses against attacks but also ensuring that, you know, as we know, a determined adversary will always get in. And once they do, how do you make it incredibly expensive for them to operate on your networks? How do you make it so that your team is coming back and delivering value to customers immediately rather than three weeks later? I, I think we have in the cybersecurity industry ignored that right of boom for, for far too long. And, and it's my hope the insurance industry can, can really help change that. That makes sense. Monica, thoughts on this? Yeah, happy to chime in. So I think when when I think about where we're going, first I'll start with like what are we trying to fix? And one of the things that I mentioned earlier is the application process, right? And and the the questions that you ask, et cetera. I think one of the areas where a cloud provider can be uniquely helpful is through scanning quite a bit of a customer's environment from the inside out and sharing that data with the industry. And getting to a point where every, let's not say every, but all many hours that a CISO is spending on, on filling out that application, they can also spend on reducing their risk. So as they're trying to um, fill out a, a new application, they'll go through a scan and they'll remediate risks as part of that scan and then send it through. And you're, to, to Davis's point earlier, you're aligning incentives of their actual work uh, and keeping their environment secure and the application process from an insurance perspective. So automation is one of the trends that I think we'll see. You'll, you're seeing Security Scorecard do quite a bit of this from the outside in. You're seeing Resilience do it as well um, in, their, in their underwriting process. Um, uh, inside out data is another trend that I think we'll see. And then through inside out data and having this, um, this process, attesting the data directly rather than having someone write it in a form. Um, are a couple of trends that, yeah, I, I think we'll continue to double down on in the in the future. That's great. And Prashan, I, I heard security scorecard mentioned a few times there. So uh, what are you thinking? So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna beat my home insurance analogy to death here. So let me let me. Uh, uh, it was funny. Like I was I was uh, at, at an event and I you know asked folks to raise hands as to how many people had a home insurance policy. And I think about 75 80 percent of people raised their hands. And then I asked, like, how many people have gone and read their home insurance policy? And I think there were like probably a couple and I'm, they were not even sure why they did that. So insurance, right, has this stigma perspective that it's something you need to have, but it's something you would really not want to think about, right? That's sort of where insurance comes from. Cyber insurance is very different, first of all. Even though it's technology, it is a man-made, it's a human-driven risk. So that's one. Second, it's constantly changing. So if you think about when you write maybe a property policy and you had three buildings, um, maybe by the end of the year, you constructed a third, uh, you know, fourth one, yeah, I didn't change, but you could start with 200 IP addresses, end up at 300, right? You could plan to only cover data breaches, but suddenly you're exposed to ransomware and then supply chain attacks and whatever else. So the peril is evolving. And so what it presents to us is for the insurance industry to be on this forefront of transforming how insurance is thought about and the value it can provide to organizations. At Security Scorecard, we are pioneering this view of continuous underwriting. Underwriting is nothing but risk assessment. It's an opportunity to, for insurance to be proactive yeah. and to be driving a better approach to how organizations can continually monitor their risk and then be able to take actions through incentives encouragement so that you know, we continually keep a handle on the risk and maintain it 
and that's a win-win that's for a win-win-win it's a win to the um the cost the insured itself it's a win for the insurance company and a win for their supply chain their partners and everyone who's involved so it's an opportunity for cyber insurance to really use this dynamic approach to risk assessment risk control where we can try, you know really stay ahead of the risk rather than be laggards and say we unwrote it let's just wait what happens till next year yeah and oh sorry go ahead please monica i'll do another plus one to prashant um <laughs> i think when when we think about insurance specifically in the context of google we're interested in using insurance as a way to incentivize customers to reduce their risk and getting to a point where you have that feedback loop of here's the control and here's the loss that resulted from a given company with these controls in place. Um, give, getting that correlation and driving, I, I didn't mention that I'm an actuary by background, so, so thinking about the actuarial approach to it, I think is ultimately what will help our society reduce uh, cyber risk over time because there'll be a carrot at the end of the, of, of the line of let's make sure I reduce this so that I can get that reduced premium or that um, the insurance policy in general. Sometimes sometimes they, you can't even get insurance in certain cases. So um, yeah, we're very interested in ROI on security and driving that through through insurance and using insurance to reduce risk. Yeah. So really and, you know, at the end of the day, you know, this is what in my title said founder of I'm actually one of one of several co-founders, um, including Raj Shah, who was worked at the Pentagon on cybersecurity efforts and our, our CEO, uh, Vishal who uh, has been an active cyber operations officer. And the point that Monica made is the real pain that we have all felt. Like, how do you tie return on investment and incentivization to controls in a way that makes cybersecurity approachable for, for the most vulnerable, right? For those that don't have the budget. Um, and, you know, this is what really excited us about the cyber insurance market. And after, you know, being running for about a year, we've seen some amazing cases where you know we've been able to come to companies that have had claims that are uninsurable work with them over a few months on a prioritized roadmap that we've shown to our reinsurers and actually get them a policy again um, or you know even bring in our uh, consultants that have worked with them after a claim that we've had and, and help their CISO argue for more budget to their board uh, we actually did some slides and, and flew out to, to Texas to help with, with the board meeting it was awesome. And we were honored to be part of that. Um, so I say it's really exciting time to start to see some of these things that uh, we've been pushing the insurance industry to do um, that finally start to take hold and finally start to see some actionable results within uh, the actual insurance and helping them, helping them improve their cyber resilience. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll, I'll kind of piggyback on the risk quantification piece because I think the insurance industry has a or is already driving and has that opportunity to push the conversation where before a CISO would go to the board um, and to management and say, hey, I need to do these hundred things. And they would just have a list of many, many things they would need to do. And then the board would look at it and say, if we do all of these, does it mean we will not have an incident? And the answer is never gonna be yes. It's, I mean, you can never, never say that an incident is not going to happen. So we need to change the conversation to a dollar and cent, to a risk and return, where by putting on these controls, by investing in these tools, we reduce our risk by a certain amount. And I think that makes it very palpable, obvious, especially as you're talking to the risk management committee, where they can understand why then they need to do certain things. So I think that's a clear statement as to the opportunity for risk quantification. Where we are is the models are still undergoing a lot of evolution, right? So if you look at the numbers, and uh, my favorite quote by George Box, who's a statistician, he said, uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Right. So and, and a lot of times risk quantification models will come out and say, hey, your risk is one point two, three, five, six million dollars. And it's not as much about the accuracy of the numbers, but it's the story that that number is telling you. If that number was higher than before, 
um, that means that you are not trending in a good direction. If that number was lower, then that's good. What, let's break down. So it's, it's more about digesting that information rather than getting fixated on the top. And I think that's another opportunity of where in the insurance, uh, both brokers and carriers can drive the conversation to say, here is the risk that you are by putting these controls on, this is the reduction you get. And by having an insurance policy, this is the financial safety that you also bring to the table. I just add that I'm seeing that a lot um, in the CISO community as well. So what I, what's really interesting about what Davis and Prashant just outlined is that the CISO community is now taking that upon themselves to say, how can I model my own risk? There's a lot of co collaboration between actuaries um, and that community through the FAIR model, for example, Doug Hubbard, who wrote um, How to Measure Everything in Cybersecurity. A lot of that is picking up um, and shows the value of the collaboration between insurance and cyber, which um, I think is, is a really interesting time. And a plug for How to Measure Anything in Cybersecurity, Doug Hubbard's co-author was um, Richard Syerson, who's a good friend, and we're lucky enough to take him on as our chief risk officer. Uh, so I definitely sec uh, second <laughs> supporting awesome. Rich's book. That's yeah, great. It's, it's a great one. Yeah. So let me turn. We've got a couple audience questions that came in, which is great. Thank you for folks that submitted questions. If other of you out there have some, please put them in the Q&A. Um, so I'll read them out just for the benefit of everybody on online here. Um, could panelists comment on the recent settlement in the Mondelez Zurich case where Zurich had unsuccessfully argued that not Petya harms were acts of war? How are other insurers and the market at large looking at this issue? And what do you think coverage and exclusions for warlike acts will look like in the years to come? And that's open to anybody on the panel that would like to address it. Yeah, I, I'm happy to start uh, and then uh, uh, hand it over to Prashant, who I know has been in this industry a long time as well as Monica, who's working a lot with other carriers. Um, you know, for the first thing that I would note that is commonly um, not known about this case or understood when uh, I talk to folks in security is that this case is actually based off of a claim for a property policy where it had, uh, you know, so, sort of silent cyber risk uh, on the, the property policy. They had they had some lines about, about infrastructure and IT infrastructure systems. So uh, this was not a standalone cyber insurance policy. Um, I'd say if you look at the numbers on standalone cyber insurance policies, uh, you, you don't see these types of, of court cases and, and claims and, and issues around warfare. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's a bit of apples and oranges when you're looking at cyber insurance versus other lines. But the larger implications here of this case are, are certainly fascinating for everybody. I think for a long time, you know, insurance never really covers acts of war, right? Like uh, this was an issue during 9-11. It, it's why um, we, the, the U.S. Congress put forward the Terrorism Risk Insurance Act was to try and, and give some clarity and stability to the insurance market that you know, looks to insure uh, buildings that were targeted by Al Qaeda um, in cybersecurity, right? Like hybrid warfare is is becoming much more the norm, especially as we've seen in, in the conflict in Ukraine with Russia. Uh, it's cybersecurity is part of the cyber attacks are part of their book, right? And you know, there are criminal actors we see from ransomware gangs that are not state directed, that are not operating as active war. But oftentimes, uh, when U.S. law enforcement goes to try and um, shut them down, the countries they're operating in uh, provide them protection. So, you know, there's a lot of gray space in what is an act of war, what is not, what is covered, what cyber insurance is responsibility, what's a company's responsibility, what's the national level responsibility. Um, and this is where it's been really interesting having a bunch of co-founders that all come from the government side of the space. Because, you know, we see the government really trying to step up and take a larger role in defending the nation and, and even private, private companies beyond critical infrastructure. And this especially changed during the ransomware epidemic, right, where you know, the attacks have gotten so bad that uh, they're really impacting a lot of what, you know, you consider Main Street style businesses, not just critical infrastructure. And so you've seen the U.S. government come out much more aggressively against criminal threats, specifically criminal threats like ransomware rather than only focused on the, the nation state warfare approach. Um, so I think this case is a signal to, you know, the government, the insurance industry uh, and private companies, right? That, that we're all gonna have to work together 
to solve this problem and, and understand, you know, where the liability lies, uh, where the financing can, can support this for companies, um, and how we all work together on, on sort of a whole nation approach to, to a collective defense. Thanks. Prashant or Monica, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, happy, happy to. So as, as you know, I'll, I'll double click on what Davis said, just, you know, insurance always has had the acts of war inclusion, uh, exclusion, because, you know, that that's uh, in many situations, uh, the government acts as an insurer of last resort. Plus, this is a, you know, cat scenario that the insurance industry uh, has not contemplated covering. So there, there's clear precedent of that. The cyber insurance uh, market has been really good about paying out claims, and you know more more often than not, uh, there have been very positive scenarios of uh, you know those those outcomes. However, the challenge that happens in cyber insurance, uh, as opposed to something like terrorism, attribution is quite difficult. It is it is very the lines are very blurred as to what is clearly. Uh, nation state action versus what are, you know, semi, uh, you know, nation state slash cyber criminal nexus. So that's where the lines get blurred. And um, I, I think more work needs to be done uh, in clarifying that. Having said that, even when you had 9-11 and it was deemed a, you know, nation state or a terrorist action, there's still a lot of uh, cases that have gone through the courts uh, when claims have come in. So, um, you know, to kind of summarize, we are seeing a lot of conversation, which many of us are engaged in with the White House and with various international governments where they're contemplated how to craft uh, language and how to think about cyber war. So we should expect, um, you know, much faster uh, or, or soon uh, for the government uh, for the U.S. government and other governments to formulate their views on what that will be, uh, and then for the insurance industry to act in tandem, and and the insurance industry is a big voice in how the government thinks about uh, defining this, and and then the insurance industry to act in tandem as to then jointly how do we go about making organizations safe. Great. I would just Monica. add when you think about insurance, um, we often have a reputational issue where everybody's worried about is a claim going to be paid is it not going to be paid and it's easy to get wrapped up in this mindset of like us versus the insurers and the insurers aren't covering us etc do you take a step back and think about what this whole issue is trying to resolve is essentially ensuring that this insurance industry can maintain itself in the event that there was a catastrophic event that really hit a bunch of policyholders at once and insure would essentially go under if they paid all of those, those claims. And um, it's, it's evolving in the talks of acts of war and a war exclusion, et cetera. But if we were to able or if we were able to better define that systemic risk that that they're really worried about and carve that out i think the conversation wouldn't be so charged i'd also uh, davis and um, prashant have alluded to this but the idea of a government backstop is generally where i'd go here if you can get the if the government can do a backstop such that insurers feel comfortable riding this risk such that um insureds will buy the insurance and be covered, ultimately that will help drive better cyber resilience. And so um, I'm looking forward to seeing the developments in the um, government uh, around this issue. Great, thank you all. I know that's a, it's a complex topic for sure and one we could probably do a, a full half day seminar on, but I think that that was very insightful. So thank you for that. Um, one other uh, quick audience question before we wrap things up. Um, someone was asking uh, for the panel's thoughts on how the insurance industry has helped companies improve policies. I interpret that to mean cybersecurity policies, although they didn't say that specifically. So uh, any thoughts on that, the, the impact insurance is having on getting companies to develop and implement better policies? Yeah, I can speak to this a, a little bit. Um, when we entered as a startup, we were a service provider, a data provider. And uh, we, we had a great idea, but we did see a lot of pushback from um, traditional carriers pre-ransomware on saying that really improving companies' policies is not our responsibility. Insurance is a financial vehicle that achieves a steady rate of return and 
as long as we can underwrite intelligently, that's the most important thing. Um, I think what ransomware has shown the industry is that in a peril like cyber, um, you need to also be helping uh, invest back in the company's own risk management process. So I think you've seen since 2019, a big shift in the mindset of the cyber insurance industry to say, how do we help with risk engineering, right? So that's the idea of going back into a company. Uh, if it's a property policy, ensuring that, you know, all of their sprinkler systems <laughs> are, are implemented correctly or, or companies like FM Global that have a long history of working on the engineering standards behind safety as well as the insurance. I think cyber is one of those categories of business where insurance providers are going to have to invest in this. Um, the threat changes too rapidly for us just to underwrite profitably and intelligently, no matter how much data or perfect intelligence we have about a company. Cyber is a human driven threat. You're always going to have an adversary who's better than a company's defenses. And so because of that, I think we need to drive our learning that we see from underwriting back into the clients and making them safer. Yeah, Monica or Prashant? Yeah, I love the how the uh, um, the person raising the question has worded it, and I love the use of uh, you know policy because one of the things, if you look at cyber, it's really a cultural issue. Culture involves people, process, and technology. So it's it's making sure that we make improvements in all of that. It's not just about purchasing tools and that's it, right? It it's all about you know people and policy. Um, as well. So that's one. And I think then the key, you know, that, that builds on top of it is as an organization, as any organization, big, small, or in the middle, you got to think about a cybersecurity culture. What is your cybersecurity culture? Is that something that you think about? Is, is that something that a number of folks and the right folks in an organization focus on? And understanding that um, you know, has has a strong bearing on how cyber safe and resilient you are. Um, and I think what, that's the thing that insurance companies want to evaluate. And you will see, and we are already seeing, that brokers are putting together large practices of advisors who are uh, going much beyond just explaining what a policy covers and doesn't cover, to, or, and just, you know, premiums to really starting to help organizations start about cybersecurity as a risk, as a strategic enterprise risk, and then help to improve their culture, people, process, and technology. I would just chime in that I'm very supportive of this. I think that's what gets me excited about insurance is um, trying to use insurance as a vehicle to change policies and improve culture. It reminds me of um, when we launched the risk protection program, which is a cyber insurance offering we have through Google Cloud. We uh, One of the foundational pillars of Google Cloud security strategy is shared fate. So rather than having a shared responsibility model, going to a shared fate model where we're in this with our customers and we're helping them with, with um, security from the beginning to end. When you think about insurance, I'd use the same term, right? There's a shared fate between the insurer and the insured and getting to a place where they can work together to actually improve that risk helps both of them. So um, yeah, very supportive of, of that sort of mindset and um, having insurers continue along that path. Well, that's great. And I think that the, that's a great note to end on as well, uh, Monica, the importance of that collaboration, right? And sort of that shared risk and a shared fortune, if you will. So um, that's great. So let me, again, thank all of the panelists today, Prashant Pai, Davis Hake, Monica Shokrai. Uh, thank you so much for being, being with us today. I think this is a fascinating topic. Uh, it's one that uh, we will see a lot more of as this continues to evolve. And I think we got a good picture of that today. So thanks to all of you. Thanks to all of our audience and uh, happy to uh, get everyone back to work on time. So have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank, thank you. Thank you, John. Thanks so much. Thanks, Monica. Thanks, John.